This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife Podcast as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board here. Appreciate you joining us, and do take a few moments and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Uh, Join us on Facebook and the Pest Geek Podcast family on Facebook. Love to hear from you. And again, you have questions, comments, concerns, love to hear from you at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear your comments. And so, hey, today's topic is actually from a suggestion from one of our listeners. Thank you very much. I won't name you out there, but I'll be very glad that you corresponded. You gave me several ideas that I will be discussing uh, in the coming weeks. So I figured I would start off, since I just got this a few days ago, I said, well, I, this one shouldn't be too hard for me to put together. So uh, others are going to take a little bit more research. Um, so, But this one I'm going to do on chipmunks. Yes, if you're, watching, if you're watching on video, you can see them up to the Wikipedia page on chipmunks. And the scientific name of chipmunks of the eastern chipmunk that I'm going to be talking with is Tiamas striatus or Tamias striatus. So it is a great little creature. People love to look at them until they start doing some damage, right? So and chipmunks can be a little bit of a problem and they can be a challenge for you as a wildlife control operator or as a pest control operator because how do you charge a, a living wage? That's what the new buzzword now, a living wage. Uh, how do you charge a profitable profitable fee for something so small, right? So it's how do you do it? People are like, really? You're charging me that much? Because they don't understand that it costs you just as much to visit for a, you know, a five ounce animal as it would be for a 15 pound raccoon same thing right so it, obviously the disposal costs aren't as high but a visit is a visit is a visit right time is money and you're still burning up your fuel so that is a marketing aspect of dealing with chipmunks that can be troublesome are there any other problems with chipmunks and the answer is yes another problem is the callbacks and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the challenge with, with chipmunks is you got to be sure. And I'll tell you, when I say sure, you know, sure is really a strong word. Uh, you have to be, I guess, confident, maybe a little arrogant. Recognize that if you need to bill it in a way that you know you're coming back after you think you're done, you're coming back. Just assume that there's a period of time that you're performing control followed by a break, followed by another callback. So be very careful how you're billing your work. Be very careful how you're phrasing your contract. What exactly is the customer purchasing? If you're going to go in there and say, we're going to get rid of all your chipmunks for this entire summer, understand you may be coming back a third time right so be very careful you may you make you can lose your shirt if you're not phrasing this properly now uh, I don't want to make it all negative here right so the benefit of chipmunks is there is the traps are cheap they're easy relatively easy to control all things considered I mean there are other animals but certainly harder and so there's some advantages there however uh, trips are still trips visits are still visits you're going to need to work that out so let's talk a little bit about some of their biology uh they're going to be mating at least once a year and actually they can produce more often than that so you can get a fair number of fair number of chipmunks in in a community obviously there's a high predation rate 
you know, if you have a lot of free-ranging cats around, free-ranging cats are going to be ravaging them. They, they, free-ranging cats kill everything, as you well know. Uh, but I'm not going to go into my diatribe on free-range cats here. So, other than just to say, if you hate the environment, you let your cat outdoors. That's all. So, that's what it means to be. When you let your cat outdoors, you're telling me you hate the environment and you want to be, you want to kill everything you can. That's what a cat does. But nevertheless, for chipmunks, uh, they they can reproduce a lot. They they are a rodent. They are the rodent family. They can numbers can get pretty high, and so you just have that's a good thing for our business, right? And then if you have situations where people have bird feeders and that seed is falling onto the ground, you're gonna you can get even higher spikes because now you have a food supply that is keeping all these chipmunks healthy and well fed. Always remember, well-fed animals are fertile animals. And if well-fed animals that are fertile have more young, and if they're well-fed, the more of those young reach maturity, which means there's gonna be a population explosion. So populations follow the supply of food, and so when you have clients with bird feeders that haven't been properly modified, that's just gonna be money in the bank for you, okay? However, understand there can be situations where people can have high levels of chipmunks without bird feeders, right? So if you have maybe a good mast production that year, that's acorns, good acorn production. Maybe there's, uh, maybe people are growing crops nearby uh, and, or other types. Maybe there's a lot of seed growing plants nearby. And so, and perhaps you have stone walls, places where chipmunks can be safe away from predators, but still access food supplies. All those types of things can uh, have some pretty high numbers of, of chipmunks, right? So it's not always bird feeders, but bird feeders would be one of the first questions that you need to ask your client when they're hiring you to control their chipmunks. You got to get control over that bird feeder because that's just going to make your job that much harder. Okay, so, so you get a call person says they have so many too many chipmunks quote unquote too many chipmunks you need to ask the question this is the question that I would suggest you ask how many chipmunks have you seen at once and the reason you have to phrase it that way is you don't want the person to be like double counting right so how many how many chipmunks did the person see out the window at one time so that they're not double counting if you start hearing numbers like three, four, five, that's going to be a lot. You know, for an average size yard, I'm thinking, you know, maybe, uh, you know, something like an acre, maybe less than an acre. So if you start getting that many, then because my rule of thumb, and again, it's just a rule of thumb, it's not gospel. Don't say, Stephen said there was going to be this. No, I just say it's a rule of thumb, something to guide you on. Whatever the client tells you, multiply that by three. So if they say they saw four chipmunks, assume there's 12. Now let me repeat that again. So if you have a client who says, I've seen four chipmunks at once in the backyard multiply that number by 12. So what that means is you want to be bringing to that location at least 12 traps. Now, do you have to bring 12 traps? No, you don't. However, it's gonna be a good idea to be doing that because let me back up a little bit. Remember, all wildlife damage falls into two categories. Transient damage, domicile damage. Now, transient damage for chipmunks typically isn't a problem. People are calling you because they're burrowing in the ground or they're in their house. People tend not to, you may be an exception, tend not to call you just because they see a chipmunk in the backyard. Most people think they're cute, they are, they're adorable, and they don't think it's a big deal. So typically, you're gonna be only dealing with domicile damage. The difference, however, for chipmunks is, is the damage simply a lawn issue or is the damage occurring in the structure? Because those are two different things. Damage to the lawn and 
burrowing in the lawn is going to be harder for you to control than chipmunks that have gotten into a structure or under a sidewalk, up into a sill space, that sort of thing. That's going to be a different issue altogether. So when I talk about the callbacks with chipmunks, I'm referring to the callbacks with chipmunks dealing with lawn damage, where there's a population issue, rather than a structural issue where the chipmunks have invaded a structure or are undermining something. That is going to be less, that's going to be easier for you to handle because you know, you can know when you're done. When you're dealing with the lawn area, that's tougher and I'll tell you why in a little bit. All right, so if they look out their backyard and they say, I'm calling you because we have too many chipmunks or digging holes all over the place, they want the chipmunks reduced or, elim or quote unquote eliminated, be careful of that contract, then whatever number they give you, I'm encouraging you to multiply it by a factor of three. That may be a little low, it may be a little high, but you need to understand that there are more chipmunks there, most likely, than what they're actually seeing at any given time. And it would also depend on the time of year that they call, right? So whether you have the birth pulse or not. So if you're dealing with something like in July, where there's probably a birth pulse at that point, that's going to be an issue that you're going to have to deal with because you might find that you're trying to catch adults and all of a sudden, bing, you're dealing with all these young as, as well and that can be a lot more work. So be sure you understand what you're coming into and ask that question appropriately. So let's take a look at some of the damage that can occur. Here we have a picture of one coming out of a hole. Notice the way that hole looks there in that particular picture. See if I can come up with some other images here. Here we have here we have some damage underneath a, a concrete step. Let me pull that picture up for you. This is what happens when chipmunks can dig underneath a slab and ultimately that can collapse over time. And that can certainly be a, a, a significant problem, right? Typically you're going to find a hole like that. It's clean there's going to be no soil around the hole. And you're looking at something that's going to be, if you can see my hand here, let me, you know, you're looking at something that's probably going to be an inch, about two inches in diameter. Okay, something, you know, something like that. And it's going to be clean. By clean, I mean you're not going to see any soil around it. Like where, so where do they put it? Well, they put it in their cheeks and they distribute it. So they, so they'll hide, and then they'll have these escape holes. So they'll have their main hole, and they may also have some escape holes where they can run to in case they get caught out and can't reach their main den. So understand, these are where you want to be placing your traps, and so they're going to be partially hidden. The ones that are going to be used more frequently are going to be a little worn, so the grass isn't going to be hiding it as easily, but it's going to be clean. It's like someone just took a, 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 a punch and just punch the hole right into the ground. So it goes straight down initially until it bends. <clears throat> and that's basically what you're gonna have with a chipmunk hole in terms of the lawn. Now when it comes to structures, that can be a little bit, that can become a little bit different. I think I have a structural one here. Here we have, this is what you're gonna find sometimes with chipmunks getting into an area. They can move a surprising amount of soil now you may or may not see a hole sometimes, but you'll sometimes just see, there'll be just this person will complain, this pile of dirt has just emerged. And it's gonna be something far above, if those of the deal with moles, you can be thinking of something, you know, around the range of up to like a five gallon bucket. It could be a lot of soil. No mole is moving that much soil at once, right? That's just not what they do. And it's gonna be different than a woodchuck, a woodchuck, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a big hole. But with these chipmunks, they can move a surprising amount of soil for such a small animal. And sometimes you will see that abutting a structure or underneath, um, or where there may be a patio where they're going underneath it. So if you see this, talk about this pile of soil, you know, think five gallon bucket size, that can be an indication of chipmunks. Now let me back up a little bit and just say, look, chipmunks don't occur everywhere. So understand that there's a range for chipmunks Right, so they don't they don't exist everywhere. Let's see if we have a map here where they occur. 
uh, doesn't doesn't say here um, what their range is. So let me put in a let me put in a search here for the range of chipmunks. So here we go. There we have a range of chipmunks. Okay, so you're looking at basically the eastern half of the continental United States going up into Canada as well. So they're primarily a woodland creature. They will go out into some grassy areas, but they tend to be around the treed areas. So of course, once you start getting out to the to the Midwest, to the Midwest, or actually the central part of the country where the Great Plains are, their numbers drop, fall off and you start getting into 13 line ground squirrels. So typically most people know if they exist in their area. So sorry for those of you in the Western part of the country, this podcast, you know, isn't for you unless you're just interested in learning about all types of animals. So I'll, I'll try to do something on prairie dogs for you to kind of bring you back into the fold. Okay, so chipmunks, there you go. Looking at the eastern half of the country, those of you in the southeast corner in Florida, you don't have them down there, and also along the coastline of North Carolina, South Carolina, and southern, southeastern Georgia, you don't have them. But maybe this map's a little old, so maybe your situation's different, right? But so that kind of gives you an idea. Basically, it's the eastern forests where this animal uh, where this animal occurs so make sure you have them in your area to before you begin determining well could this be a chipmunk right so think about that when someone's calling you about what you're dealing with because when I saw my first pile of soil I didn't know what it was it was didn't make didn't make any sense to me but again I'm dealing back in the 80s right so we didn't have a lot of the information resources that we have today so you don't have to have the same make the same mistakes i did just like i learned from other people as well uh it's education's always cheaper than exper experience just saying all right so hopefully you'll find this particular presentation worthwhile for you so when we look at some more of this damage stuff to see now this isn't chipmunk damage this is vol damage i don't know why this has been labeled as that so this is one of the problems with using google or Bing search images people don't always tag their images properly okay so understand that you're not going to see no no uh, chipmunks doing this they're just not doing that right that's more like vol damage or perhaps a collapsed mole burrow but this is this is vo more like voles this is not chipmunk dealing with chipmunks is pretty straightforward let me see if i can find another image here for you that would be appropriate for uh chipmunks this would be something similar for a chipmunk here not the best shot to be sure You can find some more. I might have to grab. Oh, here we go. Here's one. See how it's clean? It's very clean there. There's nothing that shows you what it. Now that one's obviously been used for a while and it's rained recently. But you can even see the the acorn shells, husks around it. And you tend not to see any feces around it. It tends to, like I said, just punched right in right into the hole, right into the ground. I mean, so that is going to be your sign of chipmunk chipmunk damage so let me clear some of this out so how do we control them let me be blunt you know don't waste i don't think there's any value and i'm happy to have my opinion changed i i put the call out i, I sometimes get emails from people who are trying to tell me this particular repellent or frightening device works this or that and i'm like hey send me the evidence don't send me your opinion send me the evidence now i understand that a lot of manufacturers don't have the money necessary to do a peer-reviewed scientific study on their product i get that and i'm not trying to be a jerk here okay i think there's a lot of products out there that that we know work but we don't have the scientific blind study done to prove that they work right we just know that they work the problem is like, you know, when we use a trap, we know it works because we have a body to prove it. The question is, is when we're using things like repellents and frightening devices, you'll hear these reports saying, oh, they work all the time. But I'm like, if all this stuff worked half as well as the manufacturers claim that they work, why are we in business? Why are, why are wildlife control operators in business anymore? So here's the rule of thumb I have. If you're, if you're producing these products, 
and you're hyping them as the end all and be all of everything, I'm going to say, prove it to me. I, I show me where I'm wrong here. And I, and I have yet to get the kind of evidence necessary. And in fact, when I do see some, you know, when I do see some research on products, you find that they don't work. So you may say, well, I know so-and-so had it successful. Well, here's the problem. You can, animal behavior is so complex at times, you don't know why that animal abandoned an area. For example, you may have, let's say we're going to having chipmunks in the backyard. And you go out to the backyard and you're like, I'm going to blow my nose. And I'm going to throw my boogers down on the ground. And that's going to be the repellent for these chipmunks. And lo and behold, a week later, the chipmunks are gone. And you're like, oh my God, I have boogers that work to get rid of chipmunks. I need to market this. Well, here's, here's the problem. When you're dealing with behavior, there's always going to be outliers for correlation doesn't prove causation. So just because you did X and Y happens doesn't mean that X caused Y. You need far more evidence because there could have been maybe a very efficient weasel came through and wiped out your chipmunks. Maybe a weasel and a cat and a hawk and an owl took out your chipmunks. Maybe a disease got them. So you have all these other options for control, but you blame your boogers. You think your boogers are the ones that caused the, caused the result. So this is why you keep getting these reports of this frightening device or this repellent. Oh, it worked for me or it worked for grandma or it worked for my cousin Eddie or whatever the case may be. This is why you keep hearing these stories because there's always going to be a small percentage when everything clicks, but it may not have anything at all to do with the device or product. So if you're wondering why I'm a bit skeptical on some of these miracle cures. That's why. And again, I'm happy to have my opinion changed. If I find my opinions changed, you'll, I'll try to let you know. But when I keep asking man, these manufacturers for data, I, it's crickets. Or I get some sort of testimonial from, from someone I don't know. And I know a lot, I know the names of a lot of people within our industry, people that I, if they said XYZ was effective, I'm going to be like, I got to really take that seriously because I, I, I think that guy's respectable and that he's done enough work to prove it because his name is on the line. But just from, from some, you know, forgive me folks, but just because some big name pest controller says it works for him, that means nothing to me because I know the callback rate some of these companies have, and I know at times that some of these companies are just like, you know, they may have had a bait station on the ground as well. I just, I need something more. I need to know that someone is a full-on wildlife control professional that's backing it up. And that I hear it from a couple of them, because if, it's just, because if their name is behind it, because I know wildlife control, there are some wackadoo wildlife control operators, I'm not suggesting there aren't. But the thing about pest control is rodenticides cover a lot of sins. And a lot of times, pesticides really make up for sloppy work. In wildlife control, where we don't have the ability to use a lot of these pesticides, you either get the job done, or you didn't, because that animal's still going to be there doing its thing. And I kind of hope that kind of makes sense for you. So I, I'm really kind of hammering this home here because I hope that this is an issue that you understand when I, why I don't talk a lot about repellents and frightening devices because my experience and knowledge reading in the industry is that they don't work on a consistent enough basis to make them worthwhile for most of us in our business. Doesn't mean they don't have a role, and there are some very limited circumstances where there's actually evidence that these products work. Sometimes they may only work for a short period of time, and that's maybe helpful, but most of our work in this industry is for people that want a long-term solution, not just for a few days so a wedding can get through. Okay, I hope that kind of helps make sense. So I'm not gonna talk 
about repellents and frightening devices because I I just not convinced that they that they work but I'm open send me the data send me the evidence send me people that I could trust if you don't have if you don't have that kind of evidence and and I think there's a need for more for more research obviously within our industry all right enough about that so what is the way what are the ways that we control chipmunks what what how do we do it well let's talk about traps first I am a big fan of rat traps okay uh, I not that I used them a ton and when I was doing chipmunk work but I am a fan of rat traps and there's basically two styles that we're going to deal with right we're going to have what I call the striker bar style I'm going to encourage you to use the expanded trigger models and then I'm going to tell you to modify your snapback triggers by putting some sort of a um, piece of metal underneath these two tines here. Those of you that are watching, it's where the two tines come over the Victor name. You're going to put a little piece of metal under there. I used to you can use a washer. Sometimes you can put a little a nail underneath it. The reason is, is that when those tines are, let me put my hands up here if you can see it properly. When those two tines are, are embedded into the wood, you're losing some of the tension. And so by putting a piece of metal under there, it's not going to get buried into the wood. The tines aren't buried into the wood, and so you're getting a stronger tension. What's the tension for? Well, it makes for a good snap, and you want that bar coming down to hit that animal like there's no tomorrow. Not that chipmunks are as strong as rats. They're not. But you want to try, you want a good, you want as good a kill as possible, right? We want to be humane and responsible, because you're going to get bad hits. Let me be blunt with you here, right? You're going to get bad hits. So understand that you want it dead as quickly as possible, right? And that you want a good hit to the extent possible. You want that coming down with as much force to uh, knock it out before it, before it dies. So that is certainly, it's a cheap option, very good. What are you going to bait it with? You can smear some peanut butter on it. Not a lot, because you want to be sure they fully commit. You want the bait to be put into that little cup at the top. And then, or maybe the upper half, what I would do is smear some peanut butter on there and then sprinkle some sunflower seeds, or you can use oats. Chipmunks like grain. So put some uh, sunflower seeds up there. Black oil is good. You can try some oats up there as well. And bait it. Now, here's, here's the caveat. Do not let these traps have a view to the sky. Now, what do I mean by that? You have, if your trap is here, you have got to cover that trap somehow so birds can't see it. Because they're going to be attracted to those seeds. When you start whacking birds with this trap, you're going to have a problem with the North American Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Not a good thing. That is not professional. And I'm telling you right now, you've got to make sure that you do that. So you're going to put those traps inside of perhaps a bait station. Okay, bait station. There's all. You know, this is nothing new for you guys. I'm not telling you anything. You, a lot of you don't know already, right? So, put them in some bait stations. Again, I'm not making any money on these products, so I'm just simply pointing some out for you. Bait station. You don't want to put them in a bait station. You can build your own. Let me kind of give a little diagram here that I've seen people have some pretty good success with. Again, it's you know it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So you're going to have basically a little box wall in the middle and you're going to basically create cavities and so you're going to have a little hole I'm just going to draw some holes here and you're going to have your traps inside so let me hold that up for you so you can see it so you notice how you have your box and then you basically put your traps in these little caverns, these little uh, cubicles, and then with a hole in the side on each side, and then you have a cover. So when the chipmunk sticks its head in to go at the trap, it's, it's focused right on that bait area. And then wham, and so now the bait is out of view. They have to go through a little hole, and you'll have them like this and you can catch them in, in bulk really cool you can use pvc pipes you know be creative the key is is don't let birds see the trap are there other types of traps available certainly 
I call this sort of a clamshell trap. This is one from JT Eaton. Put the bait inside of the cup and maybe a smear a little bit uh, on the, on the trigger but don't put a lot because remember you got to have that animal fully commit and the beauty of this type of trap is is that you have you don't have to get your hands dirty up on the striker bar you just go to the back of the trap click it it makes it really easy to get rid of the body and that's one of the advantages of these traps they're more expensive of course but I, I like that type and there's a variety of them out there right so I'm, I'm just talking about this one you know here's another one that uses a striker bar Again, the advantage is, is it has that other bar that you don't have to touch the bar that hits the animal. And why is it a problem? Because remember, animals are dirty. Don't touch that. And if there's anything you can do to make yourself a little bit safer dealing with wildlife, you don't know what kind of fleas or ticks that are on that animal, and you want to keep some distance. Now, a lot of those ticks and, ticks and fleas may have left because the, as the animal cools down, it's leaving the carcass. But you don't know how long it's been there. It may have been dead, may have been caught a few minutes earlier. And, and the ticks body's still warm and all of a sudden you're going down there messing with it and all of a sudden the flea is jumping onto you or the ticks are trying to move to you, right? So wear your gloves, but also anything that makes it easier for you to set the traps and, and get the carcass out, that's, hey, that's gravy, that's all the better, right? But again, these traps clearly are more expensive than your traditional wood-based striker bar victor traps right so but again it's not about good or bad it's about what works for you what your finances are what you have available you know but use a lot of traps that's the key so remember my my principle whatever the client saw or whatever you see multiply that by three and that's kind of what you want to be shooting for in terms of your in terms of your trapping so there's a whole host of traps out there that are going to be available for you here's another type of clamshell trap that's pretty neat, right? So, you know, whatever you want to use, make sure they're rat sized and use and use enough of them and make sure they're inside of a box or a covering so that birds can't see the seeds. That's key because you don't want to be attracting birds. Now, where do you place the traps? We want to place them near where the holes are. Place them where people are seeing the chipmunks go, right? So if you have one near a hole, all the better you're going to catch it near the hole now for those of you that can't use snap traps because some states are prohibiting the use of snap traps for anything other than commensal rodents then you want to start thinking about uh other types of traps and so let me uh let me pull let me pull this up then talk about traps for chipmunks forgot to mention those so here we have some cage traps this is one that I used a lot of. They're cheap, you know, by cheap meaning inexpensive, right? So I would use them in a one door, a one door fashion to put the bait on top of the treadle in the middle. I don't use them in a one door fashion. You can have other types of designs here. Yes, I'm not a robot. Oh my gosh, forget that. Let me do some images. Okay, so Here's, here's one, I mean, you, this would work. Gosh, keeps wanting me to identify me. Forget that, here we go. You can, this should work. I've never used one of these, but this should work for you. Again, you wanna make sure that the mesh size is at least half by one. Nothing larger than that, because you don't want the chipmunk to squeeze, to squeeze through. Another trap that, would, that I've used is this one. This one's pretty neat. Just make sure when you set it that the bar is not going to be too close to a wall because that bar needs to swing out. So if you put it too close to the wall, it's not going to swing out and the animals are going to get your food. So the beauty of cage traps, of course, is that you don't have to worry about, you know, if you catch a bird, you just release it. Make sure these traps are checked daily. They need to be checked daily. If you're using cage traps, if you're not checking them daily, that's a problem. That, that's the problem. Okay, so this is certainly something you can use. And here we have a picture of one caught into one of the traps. Again, they're adorable. Here, notice where the person uses their bait, some sort of a cracker with some peanut butter and then some seeds like peanuts on top of it. Again, use, use what you have available. Just remember that these are seed loving animals. So use, use seeds and be sure they're visually attractive uh, to them and placed properly where you're seeing the activity. All right, so pretty standard stuff when it comes to pretty when it comes to control, and that's pretty much about it for the traps. And what about toxicants? 
Well, I've searched for toxicants on for chipmunks. I've seen people advertise, I mean, have articles saying such and such a toxicant is suitable. Here's a, a story, bust chipmunk poison in 2021. I looked through it and I looked at one of the one of the products they said was for chipmunks. When I looked at the label, I couldn't find chipmunks, so I don't know what they're talking about. Read your label carefully. Remember, when we're dealing with vertebrate toxicants, you have to have the site and the pest on the label to use it for that animal. It's not like other pesticides where as long as you have the site, you're good to go. When it deals with vertebrates, you have to have the site and the pest. Both of them have to be present. So I know that I'm sure a lot of chipmunks are getting killed because we're controlling for mice, but we're using a rat size bait station. I'm not sure why people are using a rat size station to control mice. Mice don't need that big of a hole, right? But uh, I've talked about that in a previous podcast, and so, uh, but I digress. So let's, I know people go wink, wink, and we're all, you know, we're skirting the law. I'm not a big fan of that. If you know, if you follow this podcast at all, I think it's a problem. I think it's unprofessional. I think the EPA needs to step in and, and encourage manufacturers to have a sliding door for their rat, rat size bait stations. I did a blog on that. I've encouraged manufacturers to be preemptive on this so that we can reduce the amount of rodenticides getting onto the environment. Because the fact is, a lot of people are poisoning, have rat poison out in their backyards and bait stations, and of course, chipmunks are, are all over it, right? And they're getting whacked by it. So that's a problem because they're able to get access to this. So I'm not aware of any rodenticide that's available for chipmunks. Now, when it comes to fumigants, however, I do believe we have some fumigants for chipmunks. And so let's see what comes up there for, burrow, for burrowing chipmunks. Let's take a look at our Penn State extension. See what they come up with here. Let's do a... See here in Pennsylvania, none of the products are registered for, for chipmunks. So you need to kind of check that out a little bit. Now this is where those of you using your carbon monoxide generators that would certainly be a product that would be available. I would love to hear any research on that in terms of your findings, whether you're, how low, what your injection time is uh, on your chipmunk, chipmunks. I would love to hear about that because I haven't heard any information on that. Because people are using them on voles, which is totally surprising to me. I think it should definitively work on chipmunks without, without a doubt. So why don't we go to one more issue here. I did some search on, with Nez Peers, I couldn't find anything for chipmunks. Did some search at the EPA, couldn't find anything there. So there's lots of rodenticides out there, but whether they're labeled for chipmunks, haven't been able to, haven't been able to find it. So ultimately, I think we're looking at trapping as the solution for controlling uh, chipmunks. In, and I think that's appropriate. The reality is, is that you should be able to trap fast enough to control your chipmunks. So what are the best practices for controlling chipmunks? I'm going to suggest that you put your traps out and you pre-bait. If you're dealing with only a small a number, then and they're not a big deal for you to, to visit there, then maybe you can start trapping straight away. If you, have a, if you have a client that can check, all the better. But you need to make sure you're putting out enough traps. Make sure you find out what the life cycle of chipmunks are in your area. When are they giving birth in your particular area? Contact your state wildlife agency or your state extension. Find out what the pattern is in your particular area. How many litters do they possibly have so you can plan accordingly. And I'm gonna encourage you to understand you wanna trap aggressively, get the body count down, and then your things are gonna have a lull. And the chipmunks are then going to redistribute from the neighboring yards into your yard. This is why you have to be careful of how much you guarantee. Because you can eliminate all the chipmunks in that particular property, but understand the chipmunks that where you weren't able to control are going to redistribute and reorganize themselves and fill the void that you've created. That's where the callback comes. So make sure you have that in your contract. Otherwise, you're going to be up a creek and lose a ton of money. 
So make sure you're working that out with your client. All right, well, that's chipmunks. Not a lot to say about that other than just, you know, when you're dealing with something in a house, you can always cork the hole. If you trap a few, cork the hole with some newspaper to make sure that they're all gone before you seal that off. But chipmunks tend to come around walking foot areas where the stairs, you know, the concrete stairs, those are hollow underneath, and they'll often come in along the sill line. There are occasions where they may be able to climb up along the corners of vinyl siding and get in at a higher level or squeeze underneath the garage door. Those are some common areas as well. So they are climbers, so keep that in mind. Don't just be focused so much on the ground. That's all you're going to look for. Make sure you look above as well. Well, that's going to be about it. Love to hear your comments on chipmunks. I think they're really cute, and you can make some money on them if you're careful how you write up your contract and what your service agreement is going to be. And use enough traps because it can be at least something. What I loved about chipmunks is I didn't have to climb ladders, which was always a blessing. So my name is Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Do take a few moments, subscribe to our channel. I uh, would love to hear from you on Pest Geek Podcast on Facebook, or you can drop me a, an email at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. And then remember, we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.